paranormal, UFOs, monsters, mysteries. You're listening to Talking Weird. And now, from a cabin deep in the Northwoods, your hosts, Dr. Dean Bertram and Jen Durrell. Well, hey, baby. Well, hey, baby. What's new on Planet Jen? On Planet Jen? Yeah. What's uh, going on there? My life is not that exciting, sweetie. So <laughs> I don't really know what to tell you. <laughs> well, I know, I know you were saying when you were at your, where you work, the haunted location, as I call it. I know you, you were having some experiences there kind of of a type. I don't know if you can talk about them though, because other people were involved. So maybe I shouldn't bring that up. Well, some of it's a little personal. So, oh. I mean, I, I would necessarily call the location that I work at haunted. I would call it like, um, what it's made out of is kind of like a spiritual battery, uh, uh, or, a not a spiritual battery, like, um, uh, conduit, like it, Anyways, so there's there's several things that that uh, can happen, and so this week I I hear voices and stuff like that. So there were some women out in the garden talking, and um, I had to go investigate. Nobody was out there, so no nobody, nobody else heard it. It was just me. So another girl today that was working told me that she heard some people talking as well. So that seems to be the quite popular. Is it more? Lately. Is it more active at different times of the year? Like when now the spring's here, will it be more or less active? Or do you know? No, it's it's active all year round. I mean, maybe around birthdays or death dates, maybe. Oh, okay. But I mean, it's fairly active. Uh, but that to me, it's what I think is is just a recording hmm. majority of the time. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah, what about you? you any, any more neat stories about your daughter and goblins? Well, I shared on Facebook, but only the people, <laughs> my friends on Facebook and pay attention to my feed probably would have seen that it was funny yesterday, just out of the blue. Like we weren't talking about dreams or goblins or anything. We'd been totally out of the blue. My yeah. daughter just looked at me and said, I had a dream about goblins. They were out the back. Mm -hmm. You were shooting them. So it made me think of Hopkinsville, of course, because well, yeah. that's where, whenever you think of somebody shooting goblins, the first thing at least that comes to my mind is the Hopkins, the Kelly Hopkinsville goblin story in Kentucky back in the day. Yeah. But a cool dream nonetheless, mm -hmm. whatever the guy, I didn't, and I didn't, I didn't want to push her. Like, what did the goblins look like? You know, I just thought I'll leave mm -hmm. her. You know, you don't want to yeah. be, you don't want to be, you know dredging too much yeah. weirdness up. And it was, she was very comfortable with the story. She wasn't scared. Say, about she it. wasn't scared. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't like a nightmare or anything. So I was just like, Oh, okay. That's cool. That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. Well, that's like her little creatures that she used to have too in the backyard. The, the flippets. flippets. What were they called? Frippets. Frippet, yeah, frippets. See? yeah. She used to call She's out. She's very them. imaginative. Yeah. Well, she does. I mean, I think she thinks the whole area here has got all kinds of magic and uh, she thinks we have a house it? brownie, which I think is wonderful. Well, she you thinks could? we do. Yeah, because when you talk about them a lot, things happen to your microphone. Ah, no, I won't talk about the brownie so much. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll ask tonight's guest about, <laughs> about the other crowd a little bit, because I'm sure, I don't think it's something we automatically were going to ask tonight's guest, but we should, I bet you should, I bet you should yeah. have some input. We'll ask her. Anyway, yeah, she's, she's a sure. globally renowned professional quantum hypnotherapist and open channel offering clients and students a diverse menu of other size services, including energy alchemy and ET contact and paranormal experience counseling. She has had lifelong experiences since earliest memory with many forms of non-local consciousness, including extraterrestrial, interdimensional and celestial beings. From early childhood, she has used her gifts, perceiving and using energy, channeling, telepathy, at will, out of body, travel, and remote viewing to aid others with healing, self-discovery, obtaining answers, and conscious living. She lovingly hosts a standing Kansas City, Missouri-based CE5 Human Initiated Contact and Consciousness Group and is an active member of several international CE5 contact teams. She's also a long-standing yoga and meditation teacher, an accomplished author, a sustainable living activist, and she's a nationally ranked martial artist. 
In addition, she's the producer of the uplifting documentary film, Alien Abduction Answers, which we actually will premiere at Midwest Widfest this yeah. year, and it won the festival's Best Documentary Award. So it's fantastic to, to have her on to talk a little bit more about that. And it features that film, her quantum hypnotherapy and counselling work with some of her clients who were experiences yeah. since childhood childhood of often confusing and sometimes frightening encounters with extraterrestrials and other types of unexplained phenomena. So I'm delighted to welcome to the show, Debs Shakti. Yes. Greetings. Hey, greetings, friends. How are you? <laughs> it's so You're good to good. see you. I, we last saw you yeah. at, at Midwest Weird Fest in Eau Claire at the beginning of March, where we yeah. met. I was so blown away by that festival, Dean. I just, <laughs> I loved every second of it. Oh, thank it was, you. It was so cold and snowy and ugly up there in the most beautiful place, but you guys, you know, the whole festival just lit everything up. It was so wonderful. Loved well, it. Thank you. It was so wonderful to have you and John and Alana and Arthur yeah. and yeah, Melissa and the rest. Up. There were so many people from the film there, which was just yeah. incredible. Yeah, we had a blast. It was just, it was an amazing weekend. Really, I loved Thank it so you. much. Well, it's an amazing film. I think we're going to play a little yeah. teaser trailer from it that features you. Then we can mm -hmm. talk a little bit about, about the film following that. Going. Awesome. It's always fun bringing up the technology and oh, poor Jen gets burdened with this while I just sit here and get to ramble yeah. on. She's got to fiddle with all the... I had to use two screens this time. Okay. <laughs> all the backstage <laughs> technology. Here we go. Let's get this going, hopefully. Okay. I was able to perceive things from a more global perspective. I felt nothing intimidating from any of these experiences. So I didn't have fear. For me, fear is a human response to danger and I never felt in any danger. So that was just a little clip. That's a little teaser, which features just a little deaths. teaser. Oh yeah. my goodness. <laughs> and to think it's been over a year since we did that particular interview. It was just so funny. Oh, yeah. You know, I, yeah, I, I didn't realize that part was going to be used in the film. I thought I was just nope. having a conversation. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's, yeah, it is interesting because, you know, most of my part in the film is as the therapist who, you know, kind of helps everyone, all these experiencers, especially the films, the filmmaker, John Yost, uh, kind mm -hmm. of uh, look at those experiences uh, clearly through quantum hypnosis. And then um, their, their whole view of what happened as they were children and on through their lives kind of changed or became even more enhanced. So, uh, yeah, so I get to kind of play two, two parts there in that film an experiencer and uh and the person to help the other experiencers so was it was it yeah. interesting it must have been strange wearing those multiple hats like being interviewed being a producer helping people mm -hmm. did you get to did you get to how many of those people did you know beforehand because i think in your intro it said some of them were already your your yeah. your clients mm -hmm. or you'd already helped some of them so did you know some of the cast and well, not to cast all, the subjects, I guess, of the documentary going into that. Right. All of them were former clients who have become really dear friends. Um, uh, some of them were clients of mine from quite some time ago. Actually, mm -hmm. when we first started, the, the film idea was, was John's brainchild uh, because we were working towards getting him to do this type of session to look at something that was really terrifying that he went through in his early childhood. And when he finally agreed after a long time of, of kind of easing him into it uh, with some mini sessions, uh, when he finally agreed to do what he called the big one, he went all out and said, hey, you know what, I wanna do the big one, but I wanna do it 
on film real time, are you game? And so that was the main idea for the film, the original idea for the film, uh, which was highly unusual for me, never done anything like that before. But once we got through his session, which was mind boggling, by the way, everybody will see it and just be blown away, I think. Um, you know, the what I had told him was, your story is very unique, but many of the variables are very stereotypical to hundreds of others of my clients over the decades. And, uh, you know, and, and the outcome is, seems to always be the same. And he said, wow, you know, I'm wondering if any of them would like to tell their stories on film too, that might flesh out the film a little bit more, make it mm -hmm. more relatable. Could you ask some of them? Well, I pulled a lot of my clients. Most of them just kind of wanted to stay private. Some of them were really brave and decided to come on. And that really did uh, add a big dimension to the film. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that so many of them, of the experiences or the abductees or whatever term we we prefer to use or perhaps what they would prefer to have used to be more appropriate but they mm -hmm. seem to be they seem to be they seem to see different things like people who aren't used to the complexities of the experience of phenomenon or the abduction phenomenon seem to think it's all very cookie cutter so there's a bright light there's little gray man there's but that isn't what comes across in the film at all can you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that no, you know, and, and I think you guys can really relate to this too, because you do a lot of research and your interests are in a lot of the different types of what I call non-local consciousness or consciousness, right? Uh, all these different entities, I think are different versions of the same thing, which I think include us. But, uh, you know, what I tend to believe from my past experience is that people get the experience that is most relatable to them and what they need and what they have already you know have in their minds so i think these beings use uh things that are already in our minds symbols if you will to contextualize mm -hmm. for each individual in a way that is most pertinent to their reality right so you know, uh, even Whitley Strieber, who is, we're so honored to have him in our film too. He has uh, gone on to say, and I've always believed it too, that, you know, th it, throughout the centuries, even depending on what people's belief systems were, their encounters with non-local consciousness were relatable to that era. You know, uh, back in, in, in ancient times, they were gods or angels or deities, um, mm -hmm. beings, you know, from the heavens, star people, uh, other, you know, in medieval times the, you had the fairy folk, you had, um, you know, those types of people uh, in different parts of the, of the world, they call them different things. I think, you know, that's what leprechauns are. That's what brownies are. That's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that's what ghosts are. Um, so each one of these experiencers may have seen things or experienced things that were similar or kind of along that foundational understanding globally that we have of what we think these are. But then each one got something different. For instance, Alana, who you guys know, um, mm. who is in the film, you know, she had an experience. And yet when she began to be afraid as a child, when she saw this being standing over her bed, it morphed into the, the picture of the cat that was on her wall. So that she, I think, so she wouldn't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, uh, and I won't spoil anything, but but John, the, the director of the film, the filmmaker, you know, for most of his life, he said he saw the cartoon character Ultraman outside his yeah. bathroom. Yeah. You know, Ultraman. I mean, yeah, the figure, you know, so um, when my very first experience that I can remember, I think I was two and a half, three years old. I saw something out my window that looked like little monkeys with big, big eyes in the tree outside my window. 
um, and I called them space monkeys, but I, mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about space at the time, nor did I know anything about monkeys. Mm -hmm. I may have heard the word monkey, but I'd never gone to the zoo yet or anything, but I called them space monkeys and they wanted me to come out and play, you know, and uh, I got in a lot of trouble that night because I kept going and asking my mom if I could go out and play with the space monkeys <laughs> in the tree. And, <laughs> Ultimately, after about the fourth time of me getting her out of bed and her having to put me back in the bed, she just she very sternly said, I don't ever want to hear about those space monkeys again or you'll be punished. And so, you know, yeah. already you get shut down a little bit. But so, yeah, Gosh. long answer to a, a short question. But... No, it's it's also <laughs> fascinating. I have to stop myself yeah. because Jen has so many questions. I know. So I'm, I'm going to ask a question. and I'm going to throw it to Jen. Okay. Do you, and I, this is something I was talking to Jen about earlier today, not in reference even to what, not in reference to us going to be doing this interview or this chat with you, just because I'm all, I'm always chatting about these kind of things with Jen. Yeah. Do you think there, do you think these things have a root objective appearance or do you think it's, or do you think it's something which essentially like maybe when John saw Ultraman, it literally was Ultraman then there and then for him. But does that mean whatever it is, the phenomena, it just morphs and changes or does it is behind the mask, literally a gray alien or is, is behind the mask, literally something else, which has an objective form or is it always malleable to a personal psychological level and to a cultural level. So it will always change and there won't be that root objective physical appearance goodness i think you know that's a really deep and good question yeah. um but i i will tell you that what john thought he saw as ultraman when we went into the experience turned out to be something completely different um and that's not to say that he did not see that form as ultraman when he was a seven-year-old child and now that he has more ability to handle the greater truth of what that being was you know he could see it during the hypnosis session that's one theory the other theory i have is that you know these beings who can um be perceived or who can communicate through us through these different layers of frequency because that's what i believe i believe in the quantum universe with infinite frequencies and infinite versions of ourselves basically and other beings if you like all connected i believe that if they have the ability to communicate to us through those frequencies that they also have the ability probably to change form at will um just like they have the ability to travel through time space at will um mm -hmm. i know for a fact at least from what I've been told through channeling and through my own personal experiences with these beings that, um, you know, they travel at the speed of consciousness and for the most part do not take on a physical attribute unless they choose to. So my mm -hmm. idea would be that they can change form however they like, but that there is a certain signature maybe that they maintain from a base form, maybe that feels most comfortable or that gives them the ability to work in this particular place. We we live in a really slow moving, rigid construct, you know, in third D uh, Earth life. So, um, you know, I I laughingly call my body my spacesuit. This is what my soul uses to get around in this clunky place. And maybe those forms are their spacesuits here, you know, to protect them or help them relate better. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question, mm -hmm. but that's what I think. Yeah. So can you kind of explain what exactly quantum hypnosis is? Like what you do when you, or the process mm -hmm. when you have your clients? Sure. I mean, I think most of your listeners are familiar with what hypnosis is. Hypnosis mm -hmm. is just tapping into a, a deeper, a slower moving brainwave state called the theta state. And, uh, you know, clinical hypnosis, which I started in a bazillion decades ago, uh, usually works from the alpha state, which is one, 
one state lower than our waking active state that we're in right now, beta state. Okay, we're just talking about brainwave frequencies, the way yeah. the brain cycles in its oscillations. Um, so alpha is kind of where you're, you know, reading a good book and getting, you know, involved in the story or watching a good movie. Theta mm -hmm. is where you go in and you go much deeper. It's not sleep, but it's a, a really relaxed, but very focused place. It's the place where you get inspiration, for instance. It's the place where you get so lost in a task that you're doing or you're in a state of flow that you forgot to eat lunch and dinner and then you realize, wow, 10 hours have gone by, you know? Yeah. It's the flow state. Okay, so theta is kind of where we take people in hypnosis, deep hypnosis, and quantum hypnosis is a little bit different because number one i use some practices with my clients before we ever go into the hypnotic state itself um it's not just the traditional induction that you've seen in the movies where they say you know i'm going to count you down from 10 to 1 and you know blah 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 mm -hmm. blah those are all good things and they can get you really relaxed and get you pretty deep but I'm also a lifelong yogi and uh, meditator. And, and, and so I believe that there are certain practices that can really enhance your ability to connect to universal stream of consciousness. All the information in the universe is available to us if we are in the right frame of mind, if you will. So to get out of our analytical mind's way, we do some breath work and we do some uh, sound technology, which is toning a certain sound, which kind of vibrates the cells in your body at the same rate of oscillation. And then with the breath work, we do some specialized holding and squeezing, almost pressurizing the body to push the spinal, cerebral spinal fluid up to pressurize this little tiny gland at the top center of your head, the pineal gland. The pineal gland, to get kind of scientific, it has thousands of tiny little crystals in it. And if you pressurize that just enough and squeeze it just enough, those crystals all start to vibrate at a higher rate of oscillation and they create something called the piezoelectrical effect. It's the same thing that runs your computer it's the same thing that runs uh the the information from an electric guitar my husband's a guitar player his electric guitar has an electrical pickup or two or three in it mm -hmm. it's the same thing and it sends that sound to an amplifier well that's what happens when we do this practice before i go into taking them into the hypnotic state a it relaxes the client greatly B, it sends a cascade of different feel-good hormones throughout the body so that they feel safe and kind of whole. And then C, I call it the big satellite dish, opens up in the top of the head, and there it's like a radio transceiver. It's just like your radio or your computer. You can access anything, but it's easier to tune it that way. So that's the difference between quantum hypnosis and basic hypnosis. Also, when I first started out, you we didn't even really hear about past lives over here in the Western world, but we started getting them in sessions. And then very quickly, because I came in to life with all these other gifts and was kind of not supposed to be using them in sessions, but I was, my clients were going to other lives, like not just, you know, not just early childhood, not just past lives, but elsewhere, like maybe to Mars or maybe to some dimension we'd never heard of. And I was like, what is happening here? This is wild. And, you know, over the years, it just became very apparent that, especially as I became more and more interested in quantum physics, I'm a big science buff and that just really, quantum physics explains the universe to me. Um, I started thinking, wow, we can go anywhere and access any information we need. And that's how this was born. It's just this process where we just tell the consciousness to go and retrieve any memory, any information that we need. 
and then it's spoken through the client, which I think mm -hmm. is very powerful. People will come to me all the time and I'll channel for them. And that information also comes through my voice, but, and it's very powerful and it's often bizarre because a lot of it is about stuff I have no knowledge of, you know, no education. I'm a pretty educated person, but you know, I don't know about a lot of things. I don't know about, you know, jet engines, for instance, but sometimes <laughs> that'll come out. So channeling is one thing. It's very powerful and can be very helpful. But when the client hears themselves on the recording afterwards, speaking these amazingly detailed experiences and they hear that coming out of their out of their mouths and then at the end of the session we i usually ask to go to a really high level i call it higher self um of their being to help pull everything together and, and ask if there's any advice or any healing or any messages that is a an authoritative voice that always comes through that is very different from everything else and it always sounds like the same person no matter who is is speaking it which is hmm. really bizarre and from session to session to session that voice gives me information about what's happening now and in the future of our culture it's like puzzle pieces i'll have two clients today and i'll get a little bit of information from each one and they may not seem relatable to anything. And then three weeks from now, I have another client and get another bit of information. And suddenly I have this big picture of, of, you know, a big message to give the world. So it's really kind of an interesting process. I don't know if that helps or if that confused you more, but that's, that's no, no. what quantum hypnosis says. What, what do you think that voice is, Debs? That you, you said the voice, which is similar as it comes through. Do you have a sense of what the origin or what the, the consciousness mm -hmm. is behind that voice? Right. I do. I mean, you know, everybody has a name for that. Um, you know, people who are really religious or spiritual might call it God, source, uh, the universe. But, you know, again, from a quantum physics standpoint, for me, everything comes from the same point of singularity right and we live in a fractal universe we are all holographic facets of the same thing but we each have a little bit of a uniqueness right so there is something that connects all of us and i believe that that something is not separate from us nor is it any better than us it doesn't judge us it doesn't manipulate us it doesn't punish us it's just the highest you know if you think of your being of all these layers of frequency uh evolved you know all at once living all at once forever all the time but having different experiences that highest level is what i call the higher self or for me i actually call it my big self or my nickname for it is my big i just call it my big <laughs> so my big sounds just like john's big it sounds just like alana's big it sounds just like arthur's big it's i think it is just us as we start to coalesce upward into this you know it, it's like the tip of a pyramid the apex of a pyramid it's the highest part of the consciousness that we all are together group consciousness yeah I'll ask one more question, then I'll throw it back to Jen. Ed, Ed Schultz, who's a regular guest on the show and um, mm -hmm. a good friend of ours, he's actually somebody who, who's a, a hypnotherapist as well. He asked if you'd ever heard of the silver method and if you had what mm. you thought of it. Yeah. Wow. I love the silver method. I studied the silver method probably, gosh, I want to say 25, 30 years ago, and I'm still a big mm. fan. I will still go back and visit. Uh, the, I still have the tapes that I bought 30 years ago, for instance. Mm. Finally put them onto CDs, and I still have them on my hard drive. So, yeah, I, I, you know, Silva was one of the pioneers for all of this work. So, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So 
Um, you had mentioned earlier about uh, your own experiences. So how mm -hmm. did you figure out that you were able to channel? I mean, like, what was your first experience mm -hmm. or knowing that you could do that? I didn't know. I actually okay. thought that was how humans worked. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't even remember. It was probably the late 80s before I ever heard someone give a name to it and it was channeling mm -hmm. and it was in a book called Seth Speaks by Jane Roberts, old, old book where she was channeling an entity called Seth. And then later Ramtha came out and, and people started using that word channeling. But, you know, even as a little child, my parents just thought I was really imaginative and intelligent and, you know, new things you know they just thought mm -hmm. i picked up information you know because i could sit with the adults and and you know talk about weather patterns and uh you know whatever mm -hmm. they were talking about it was really you know i was always a really good test taker by the way just even if i didn't study and it's because mm -hmm. i was able to pull that information but i didn't know i did that i just thought yeah. that's how everyone worked and then you know as i got into school, I realized, and I was, I went to a, a parochial school when I was a kid and uh, was very quickly told, you know, you don't, you don't talk like that. You don't talk about things like that. You only mm -hmm. speak when you're spoken to, and you only speak about things that you're told to speak about, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you don't talk about, you know, what Jesus was really doing when he was 30 years old, you know, these kind of things. As a second grader, I was telling the nun in my school, I'm like, you know, I was talking to Jesus one time and you know, I got sent home for school for saying that. Oh, no. so, but, um, you know, I think I was talking to the energy of Jesus or the person who called himself Jesus. So, hmm. yeah. Uh, so I, Ed Casey, did you said you said you were pulling down stuff? It remind, it makes me think of Ed Casey. Do you think there was a commonality in that kind of? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, here's the thing. After all these years of working with people, I can absolutely tell you every human being has this capability. Again, um, it's do you know you have a radio transceiver in your brain, a physical? that little pineal gland. And do you know how to find the way to tune it to the right frequency so you can hear what you want to hear? In other words, you know, what station you want to listen to, what channel you want to watch. Uh, I think the word channeling is perfect because, you know, you think of tuning to a radio channel, to a TV channel. So I do believe that. Although I think, you know, mostly Ed Casey, Edgar Casey was he was asleep when he did his. They called him the sleeping prophet. He literally was asleep when he channeled. Now, maybe that's how they perceived it. When I channel, I pretty much don't remember anything because I kind of go into my own space. I go on vacation and whatever needs to be spoken just comes through my vocal cords. Um, but, you know, but I don't look like I'm asleep. I'm, you know, I'm awake. And in fact, now when I do it online, I'm working the Zoom stuff and all this sometimes. And my body is, but I don't remember any of that. Unless it has something to do with me too, then I will remember it. Yeah. So have you had any, um, any very interesting um, channeling sessions to where, I mean, you're just like, wow, look at that. <laughs> Which one do you want to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all interesting. They're all really interesting. Um, fascinating, actually. Um, the the main group that I channel when I channel for for others, mm. um, they're called the teachers or the star teachers. Um, okay. But they came up with that name because I asked, I kept asking them for a name. They said they're literally us on one of those higher frequencies having evolved past the need for an ego label. But uh, they are really cool because they keep telling us, you know, what to expect. And it's a very encouraging message. They're, they're always saying, 
don't get all upset about what's happening in the world right now. Just do the best you can to be the best you, you mm -hmm. can and take care of your own little space, your own little person, your own family, your own community. And they just want to remind us that we actually do achieve it. We, we achieve what they call escape velocity from this construct uh, where we focus on a higher level frequency um, and live like most of the cosmos lives, which is, you know, not so restricted and not in a big negative uh, yeah. bunch of hullabaloo like we do here. Mm -hmm. So um, that can be very fascinating because when I do that with groups, often I'll get some really intelligent, uh, like, you know, actually have scientists come in and, and ask technical questions and they just fire it right back at them. And uh, it's huh. pretty wild. So, yeah. Or oh, they'll wow. just say, you know what? That's a dangerous question and you're not qualified <laughs> to hear, hear the answer. <laughs> so, oh, they wow. They told that too. <laughs> like, we're not going to tell you that right now. So, huh. Well, that's but, neat. But for the most part, they do the answer. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, whoever needs to come through. And again, I think it's like the question you asked, Dean, about uh, the forms. I think often when people ask me to channel, it comes through in a way and in a voice that is relatable to that person. For instance, if the person is more comfortable with hearing the message coming from their grandma who they loved, who's crossed over, it's going to be grandma speaking, right? Or as grandma, uh, mm -hmm. if they need to hear it from, you know, Gandhi, Gandhi's going to speak or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever commander avatar from, you know, planet <laughs> Xavier or whatever, you know, I don't really mm -hmm. care who it is. Pretty much again, when we talk about that higher self thing, um, that voice, I also tell people at the end of the day, I believe whoever is speaking to you through the channel is you speaking to yourself from the level that you need to hear it from. Do you think yeah. any negative intelligence ever hijacks it? Like, do you think sometimes other things come through that aren't positive for some you know, people? I believe it's possible, but here's the catch. The vibrational state that you are sustaining especially as the channel but also the person who is asking for the information that is the frequency that you are going to pull from or above the lower frequencies usually can't come through because you know again this is physics two uh, discordant frequencies can't be in the same space at the, at the same time it, it causes interference all you get static and it pushes away from each other. So I really try to, you know, I'm a, a pretty high vibe person anyway. I'm very positive. I do a lot of practices, spiritual practices, do my yoga, do my meditation, all this stuff. And I just am a happy, positive person. And I pretty much just don't focus on that kind of thing. And so I don't pull that kind of thing. However, I get called a lot to go to places for instance, to clear homes or buildings of an entity mm -hmm. or, you know, a haunting or whatever. And I'll go and I can absolutely see, you know, perceive and interact with who those people are telling me is there. Mm -hmm. But there's always a really big purpose for that entity or group to be in that place. And it's relatable to the people who are there there is a message on both ends of the spectrum for these people. There's something relatable that's happening. And once we can identify it through communication, it's clear and it dissipates. It's the same with those quantum hypnosis sessions with the experiencers. Once they see things really clearly, um, the trauma's dissipated and there's transformation, there's understanding. In fact, there's usually a huge sense of purpose and a positive message that comes from that. So, yeah, I, I, I have never been hijacked in 
you know, I'm, I'm 66 years old and I've pretty much been channeling since I was born, you know, able to talk. Yeah. Um, I've never had a negative force come through. I don't believe. Huh. So have you ever had, so I'm, I'm just thinking of like, I've had some weird experiences myself. So, um, so you're kind of saying like the, that's kind of a, a lesson that someone's um, supposed to actually learn when they meet something that's like they're perceiving it the wrong way. So they're actually going mm -hmm. to learn something from something that they're perceiving that's possibly scary evil. or yeah. Evil. Yeah. I don't know yes. what the correct yeah. word is. Yeah. Yeah, okay. You know, and I think it comes through that way because they're sometimes you need a pattern interrupt in your life before you'll pay attention to something, you know? So mm -hmm. what is more of a pattern interrupt in your life, but something shocking or frightening or, you know, really what it is, mm -hmm. is it's usually something that is so out of your norm that it feels scary. You know, humans are hardwired to be afraid of what they don't understand or what's different. Right. Mm -hmm. right? So, um, and then we have all the cultural indoctrination of, you know, ooh, spooky, scary demons, yeah. ghosts and all yeah. that. Well, I don't, I don't negate the fact that those entities live, they, you know, anything you can think of exists. The minute you mm. think of something, it exists, right? But mm. it doesn't inhabit your environment if you have a higher level vibration than that uh, and sustain right. that. But uh, yeah, often I think when, when shocking or scary things come through, it's to get your attention. Mm -hmm. so that you will pay attention and go on this discovery path so that you can get the message. Mm -hmm. And then healing occurs for whatever is happening. And, and like yeah. I said, on both ends of the spectrum, it's a, it's a partnership. It's not just the human or let's say what you would call a ghost. Yeah. There's a partnership there. Yeah. So do you, do you, I mean, you've, I'm sure you probably encountered since you said you've had to go to other locations and kind of help mm -hmm. out with that space right. um, and encountered um, people that have, have passed on that are stuck. I mean, is that something that. Oh, you've... all the time. Okay. Okay. All Just the making... time. Okay. All the time. And I think that happens because, mm -hmm. you know, there might be two reasons. One that person who passed on had a contract with itself in the world to uh, work a purpose and mm -hmm. part of their purpose was to bring through a message you know afterwards but they forget you know we forget what our contract is what our purpose is when we come here half the time it takes us a half or more of our lifetime to figure out what we want to do with life right yeah the other thing yeah. is that um they sometimes if they have a sudden death or a shocking death mm -hmm. um they're they're in a kind of a state of suspended animation almost until they can kind of work through that mm -hmm. um i'm sure you've encountered that before you know a being that just is kind of kind of walking lost doesn't maybe not even know it's passed on mm -hmm. So, um, but th they're pretty easy to help yeah. lift them up into the light. So, yeah. You've been doing this for, for so long now, Debs. You, I'm just curious to hear your take on, on what you thought when the alien abduction narratives that were, I guess, perpetuated by Bud Hopkins, the late Bud Hopkins and mm. David Jacobs, where mm. there was kind of this story or this mythology or this narrative that there was this imminent alien invasion and there was hybridization plans so they could take control of human society. And it, was, it was all pretty terrifying and mm -hmm. it remains pretty terrifying. I mean, some of that talk is still out there. What do you, what do you think was going on there with those kind of stories, that kind of narrative? Well, when you think back to the era that those stories were really prevalent, look at what was going on in the world. It was the same narrative of, about, you know, our enemies across the sea, what they wanted to do with us pretty much, right? The, there is this underlying narrative always of, 
you know, with the us versus them, that someone wants to invade us, enslave us, and control us. And so I think that's just, it, it was, it, it's just part of the global consciousness uh, agenda that, that gets woven into any experience, no matter what you're talking about. You talk about, you know, immigrants, and, and there's a faction of people who say, well, they just want to come in and take over, the, you know, and, and, and take over. Um, and, uh, or the Russians or, you know, fill in the blank here. But also it was just that our lack of understanding of, of what was going on, you know, people like Bud were doing the very best they could with what they had. And, uh, and they laid down the foundational stepping stones for those of us who are doing the work now. And, and we have such a broader view now of what's happening, uh, which I believe is a very positive narrative, to be honest. Um, but again, it depends on where your mind is and how you, what you believe in. I think you, what you focus on is what you get in your reality. And that sounds crazy and woo woo, but you know, the folks who believe there's going to be an alien invasion with, you know, your baby's being stolen and you're going to work in the gold mines to, you know, <laughs> give them fuel for their dark planet or whatever. That's probably going to be your reality, at least till you, <laughs> till you break out of that mindset, you know? So, but what do I know? <laughs> so what, what, what about the CE5? That is something I'm really intrigued by. And, uh, you know, that's something you're involved in. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've been highly involved for many decades. It, you know, it's, it's gone under many names. I, I think the first group I ever had decades ago just came out to my place way out in the country to lay on a quilt and look at the stars and see if yeah. we could see anything else. And I think we just called it a, a sky watch group, mm -hmm. you know, and then later on it became star seeds and then contact. And then, you know, when Greer, Stephen Greer came out and actually gave that label CE5, which means close encounters of the fifth kind or human initiated mm -hmm. contact, um, that name really stuck. And so people use it as a generic name, kind of like we all call any cotton swab a Q-tip, even if it's not made by Q-tip. Uh, CE5 mm -hmm. seems to be that that kind yeah. of uh, brand name that people like to to talk about. But it is amazing. It's so amazing because, um, again, you know, group energy is an enhancement of your own energy. And if you can build mm -hmm. coherence through the heart, I believe it. It has to do with the heart, with love, with positivity with good intentions and we do a lot of the same things in ce5 that we do in the quantum hypnosis session to activate the pineal gland to get that heart coherence you know every group does something different uh, a little bit but often there is something to build coherence in the group and then you go into meditation which is i think really key to kind of open up to that consciousness link with these other beings well when you do that your vibrational frequency raises and you can perceive way more i mean they're not really coming from anywhere they're here it's overlaid 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 in different layers but we can't perceive it because we are not within that spectrum just like you're a human being right now and you can only see this much of this huge spectrum of light believe it or not mm -hmm. that's why you can get a night vision camera and see a little bit more you can get an infrared mm -hmm. camera and you can see a little bit more right so that's how this works well when you get together in a group and you all set an intention and you raise the vibrational frequency by doing things that make you feel good together and feel kind of connected then mm -hmm. it is super easy I've had people come out. There's always at least one newbie who comes out to debunk the whole thing. And they're usually the ones that, who leave at the end of the evening going, oh, my God, I can't believe I, I just saw all that. I can't yeah. believe that. Whether it was something fantastic in the sky 
or it was something right here standing next to them on the ground or voices or, or these crazy little scintillating lights all over the place, um, craft experiences where they've been taken into a different place, a different dimension. Uh, I had one of my groups, um, it's been several years ago because it was before the pandemic, but it was probably 2019, late 2019, where it became kind of rainy and a lot of the group decided to leave because they're like, eh, it's raining. We don't want to sit out under just, we're not going to see anything. Yeah. It's cloudy, right? The ones who stayed, we went and sat under a shelter. We were at a park, we sat under a shelter and kind of reconnected. And soon we realized we don't hear anything. It was high summer. We didn't hear any of the frogs or the insects or anything outside. We could still see outside the shelter, but it was like we were in a different dimensional layer and pretty soon a park ranger came with his lights flashing and everything all our cars were still there but they were shining the lights and it was like they couldn't see us they were looking all over to see if they could find find us because we were there past hours and we were right there and they couldn't see us and uh so then we realized we were in a different frequency and pretty soon we had beings and you know we had like a little meeting little conference and had an experience then suddenly we heard the frogs and the crickets and everything again and we realized that was over and about two and a half three hours had passed and i wow. have proof of it because i always <laughs> record at least audio record everything that happens at these things and we've got it all on tape it's really wild and those hours passed and felt like 10 minutes to us so oh wow you never know what's going to happen at these things. That's like yeah. that's like fairy time. There's lots of yeah. stories yeah. in it fairy is. folk tradition where a fairy lover goes and spends a week with you know, somebody goes and spends a week with a fairy lover and they come back and a yeah. year's passed or they go for a yeah. year and a hundred years have passed. So Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you see the the similarities there. I, I really think it's the same thing. I, I just think they're different versions with with different uh cool circumstances so i just yeah. love life it's so unique and always fascinating <laughs> to me never scary i just think it's fascinating oh it is fascinating what, what do you what do you oh, no you go jen because we, we don't have that much longer i'll let you go oh no i was just going to mention that kind of like the travis walton thing you know where he was left here he was gone for several days and then came back but his is a little right. different but still <laughs> it's kind of like that <laughs> right but look what was going on in his life at the time too you know you have to again take into context what his experience was what he felt like he went through mm -hmm. was definitely i think influenced by the emotional stuff he was going through in his life and what was going on in the world and and yeah. all of that but as far as his lost time, absolutely. There's no question that he was, you know, having, that he had a, a definite contact experience. I totally yeah. believe him. What What's your take? I know you were involved with CE5, so I assume you're <laughs> familiar. And if you're not, just say, I, I assume you're familiar with some of, um, some of Stephen Greer's recent documentaries. Do you mm -hmm. think that there is what Greer suggests that there is this benevolent type of extraterrestrial contact, but at the same time, there's some type of group with inside the, the powers, the halls of power, like whether it's the U S government or whatever it is that keeps this information from the public. And at the same time, a lot of the type of technology that we see in the famous Tic Tac videos and other things floating around our skies, a lot of that is, is, I guess, advanced U.S. military technology. Do you, do you have a take on that at all? My take is, again, from the quantum perspective, everything is possible and everything is possible. <laughs> it's all happening. <laughs> Anything that you can think of is happening. But as far, you know, he has done so much work for so many decades um, I don't see eye to eye with him on everything, but I will say that 
I do agree that a lot of the technology that we have right now either came from, um, you know, otherworldly uh, beings who either shared or, you know, who we, you know, maybe back engineered from uh, from their tech. Uh, and I am very sure that there is a lot of that technology that is being hidden from the general public. Because, hey, you know, who wants to have free energy in the world and not make billions and gazillions of dollars for themselves and their cronies? You know, if you keep it quiet, you have more control over everything. So, um, you know, there is that faction of of the human sector that is always going to, to try to control that stuff. But again, you know, what I'm being told is, those people think they're in control, but they're being played just like pawns on a chessboard for the bigger agenda. And that is for the further, I don't really like using the word ascension because that sounds so woo-woo, but the, the further evolvement of the human race and into a more cosmic community. But yeah, I do believe, you know, there, uh, again, there is a spectrum of beings from this end to this end and some of them on this end are probably working in a negative way with um, some of the governing properties of the of the world so so where do you see this all going what 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 do you think is going to happen in the next i don't know five to ten years and with this type of phenomenon do you think more people are going to be conscious of it do you think it's going to become more part of our regular lives or what do you see happening to the planet yes i know that is going to be extremely prevalent it will be so undeniable and very quickly so i mean there's hardly a person you can talk to now who at least isn't aware of of the ideas of this uh you know um and, and some of them may still say oh it's a bunch of hogwash and you're just full of it but for the most part, most people are curious. They don't know maybe what to think of it, but it is now part of our mainstream conversation. And mm -hmm. even the stuff about the tech and, and all of that mainstream conversation, it's in our news every day now, you know, and it's not being laughed at as much as it was before. Mm -hmm. And uh, people are taking it seriously. The thing that that I wish would end very soon, and I hope it will, I'm being told it will, is the fear-based. You know, the alien invasion, uh, they're attacking or they're gonna silence our military force, they're invading our, our airspace, blah, blah, blah. You know, if they were gonna do something like that, they've been around, I mean, look at ancient cave carvings and drawings and, you know, even Renaissance paintings, There, there's, craft there are other beings and from other worlds and these pieces of art and architecture they've been around ever since we have or before we have they've always been here if they were going to do something like that i think they would have done it a long time ago before we got intelligent enough to at least try to fight back right huh. so yeah like if they were going to do it when they've done it already I think yeah. there's a better, a higher agenda at play. That's that's just my opinion. Well, thank you for for joining us, and for you were just such a fascinating guest. Where do people f firstly tell us a little bit about when Alien Abduction Answers is coming out, and how people uh, can yeah. see it, and then tell us how people can get a hold of what you do or get get a, get in yeah. touch with you and some of your oh, work. Cool. Oh well, thanks so much. Alien Abduction Answers is the name of the film. It's the title of the film. And uh, it will be streaming everywhere, May 3rd. Um, many, many platforms, major platforms, Amazon, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play. Um, there's a huge list and I, I can, I'll put that on my website. I don't have it on my website right now, but there is an Alien Abduction Answers Facebook page and it's on there. Um, then, it, you know, or later in the summer, it's it's going to go on to other platforms. We're hoping Netflix um, and then uh, some other platforms. And then I believe in November it goes 
into DVD distribution, Redbox, you know, Walmart, all that stuff. But uh, May 3rd, it'll go to the major, the ones that most people are used to playing on. Um, and then people can get in touch with me at my website, which is debsshakti.com, D-E-B-Z-S-H-A-K-T-I.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, I'm on TikTok, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, and wherever else. Um, YouTube, I have my own YouTube channel. Just look up that name, you'll find it. Um, I would love to help anyone who asks. It's uh, it's my great passion, it's my great joy, and uh, and it's a heck of a lot of fun. Well, th well, thank you so much, Debs. And um, everybody listening, I hope everybody has a peaceful and blessed Easter. And until we see everybody, until we see you again, Debs, keep it weird. Yeah. yeah. You too. Thanks, guys. I loved it. <laughs> thank you. It was great. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you're interested in checking out more episodes, you can find us at TalkingWeird.com. If you haven't already, please like the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Talking Weird Podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to Talking Weird. We're available on most podcast platforms and YouTube. And if you do enjoy the show, please leave us a review.